It was usually bad. And until we got above the weather, uh, you really couldn't see what was going on. There were 4,700 B-17 shot down in the war, and there were 2,200 B-24 shot down. And there were 1,000 aircraft lost to mid-air collisions and weather and mechanical failures. So some of the, the people that, that died over there didn't even get across the water. They were dead before they got away from, the, from England. There were 200,000 flying personnel in the 8th Air Force. 26,000 of them were killed in action, and 28,000 of them were captured when they were shot down. The 8th dropped 701,000 tons of bombs. We, we destroyed 6,001 enemy aircraft in the air and 3,073 aircraft on the ground. I'm, I'm going to get to the video part of my, my talk in a few minutes. Uh, I Actually, I set this talk up to, to speak to children in school, and I started three years ago when I was invited to Doyle Elementary School and I talked to the fifth grade up there. And I, I didn't know exactly what to do, and I, I put together, I had a lot of pictures that I, I had accumulated. When I finished flying, you had to have a job, and I volunteered to work in the photo lab. So I was able to get some pictures, and all the pictures I put into this book, and I, I made 35 of these books, and I would hand them out to the kids when I talked to them, but it was very difficult to keep them on the same page that I was on. As a matter of fact, I thought of telling them that I had a little gadget in my pocket, and if they turned the page before I did, I would click that gadget and the book would melt. <laughs> and I was afraid then, if I did that, that everybody would be turning the page to see the book melt. So I, I dropped that one. But the last school I talked to was uh, Simon Elementary School at Hatboro Horsham. And they, I was talking to the fifth grade class, and they have eight fifth grade classes. So it, they almost filled the auditorium. And they uh, scanned my, this book for me and put it on a tape, and I was then able to show it on a video. And no, nobody could get ahead of me on the, on the pages. They were all on the same page that I was on. And in the book, I put it, tried to put it together the way I went through the service, how I enlisted, uh, how I was called in. There's a picture. Who's, who's going to do the clicking on the pictures? <laughs> You're trying? Okay. <laughs> uh, and I, I started by saying that in, on March 14, 1944, I uh, reported to the Customs House in Philadelphia, and, and that day they took us on, on a train up to New Cumberland, and we received our uniforms and all of our supplies. And the following day, I was sent down to Biloxi, Mississippi to go into basic training. Uh, in Biloxi, uh, of course, they, that's, this is when they were trying to make everybody into a soldier. And most of the time, no matter where we went, we marched. And when we marched, we sang. And I tell the kids that uh, that seemed kind of dumb to me since I was going to be flying. Why did I have to learn to march? But I, I thought about it later, and I guess it was that you were, they were really teaching you to take commands and to take the commands in a hurry. And I tell the kids that I'm sure they go home sometime and they say to their mom, Mom, this is dumb. Why do we have to do this stuff? And I try to explain to them that it's really not dumb, that sometime later in life you'll find out that it wasn't dumb. And I tell them that there's an example in my talk where I thought some things were dumb, and they turned out not to be so dumb. Are we clicking yet? <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe I should give a demonstration of the marching. <laughs> Well, I'll go on anyway. I found, I had a, a box that I had all kind of paraphernalia in from when I was in the service and never looked at it. And every time we moved, we moved it and it went back up on the shelf. And then when I started to do this, I decided to put this book together. I started to, to look through that box and I found that I had some interesting things in there. When, when you enlist in the Army Air Corps to go into the cadet, the cadet program, 
you had to have three people recommend you, and two of the people that recommended me were the principal at Abington High School and the superintendent at Abington High School and one of my family uh, uh, priests from Clintside, from St. Luke's Church. And it, the reason I put them in the book, I guess, is because I didn't realize how I even got those things back. They were sent into the Army Air Corps, and apparently when I was discharged or at some time, they were sent back to me and I put them in the box. Um, I'm going to be through for here pretty soon. <laughs> All this high tech stuff we have. We're trying to be computer literate. We're trying to make out like we're computer literate. Okay. All right, after, after basic training, uh, we were training, of course, to be pilots. I wanted in the worst way to be a P-51 pilot, and that, that was my big ambition. And after we finished basic training, they, and we were leaving uh, Biloxi, they told us that they had enough pilots in training now and that they would need some gunners. They were running low on guns, and they, they had some openings for career gunners. And I didn't have a career, so when they said, anybody who wants to be a career gunner, step forward, I stepped forward. So that's how I became a gunner. And then from there, they sent me out to Kingman, Arizona to gunnery school. And at gunnery school, we didn't just learn how to shoot a 50 caliber machine gun. We learned how to take a 50 caliber machine gun apart, put it back together again. We learned all about, I was going to be a lower ball turret gunner, so they taught me about the ball turret. I had to do, uh, make some diagrams, and we had tests on, on this. The training was, I think, was pretty intense and it was good training. Uh, and if we had this work, and I would show you one of the tests that I took and drew a, a picture of, of the ball turret and how it operated. Oh, Jack, yes. we've gotten to the point where we've got it on the computer now, and um, if there's someone in the audience that knows how to get it to go from the computer to the uh, LCD display, I thought it was like pushing F7 or something. It was, Anybody that's uh, able to help for a... Uh, you do it then? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. First thing, turn it on. You better. You better, Jack. <laughs> yeah. On, there's a menu here. There's a menu. Okay. Uh, come down to... Uh, Select source. Okay. Video. Um, video. I don't think it's video. It's oh, wait a minute. Like, oh, go over that way. Oh, Is it video? I don't think so, no. S video? No. I PC card? RGB1, let's try it. Oh, it might be PC1. Okay. S video is on No? And let's see, on the computer, I think you toggle it to get up there and down with uh, one of the uh, function keys. Well, I thought we had you. Um. There we go. That, that obviously didn't work. Let's try video. Okay. Now, uh, that would work if we had a video down more. Ah. But you got to get to the laptop, I think, sure. I might be the bottom. So where do you want it? Come down to the bottom one. PC card viewer? Yeah. Um, now, <laughs> I don't know, uh, there's some way to get it to project from the screen here up to there. And I don't remember, I haven't done that. So I'll open it. There's a keyboard command that you have in my uh, <laughs> But I don't have it. <laughs> Modern technology. Yeah, right. George. 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 Does anybody upstairs know how to work that? 
Congress would fund PC2 on the extron panel. God bless. What's the next one? Yeah. Did it did have trouble? I didn't on the, the, the at the other school. <laughs> That's right. Is there anybody upstairs that would know? Okay. Thanks, pal. What's the RGB2? Yeah. Uh, if that's what you put in we're getting close. Show me try at the end of the picture. Yeah, try it. That work? No, you. You're on the smell. Maybe I'll just go through what I have in the book here without giving you the, the pictures of it. Use your imagination. Right. I, I put together this book and uh, that uh, shows a picture of the ball chart and how it uh, fit into the airplane and a picture of the training that they gave us. Uh, when we first got into the ball turret, uh, they had a ball turret up on a scaffold. And we would get up on the scaffold, and they would let us climb down into the ball turret, but wouldn't shut the door. And we would just sit there for a few minutes, and the next day we'd come back and get in again and stay for a little longer, the next day a little longer. And finally, they would close the door. We would just sit there and, and get used to being in that ball turret. Now, actually, the size of the ball turret was probably, if it were laying here on the floor, it would only be about that high. And when you would sit in that ball turret, you would step down into it, and then sit on a seat like this and bend over, and then the door would be shut, and that's the way you would stay for up to eight hours. I found that if you put that turret in the right position, it would be much like being in a chair in your living room that would sit back and your feet would come up, so you could really take a nap in there real fast. But it was the place that, because that's where you were, I was trained, it was the place that I was most comfortable. One time, uh, the waist gunner uh, asked me if, you know, if he could fly in the ball and I would fly in the waist. And in the waist, they wear uh, what they call a flak suit, and it looks much like a, a catcher's uh, garment that would come down and protect the front and hang down the back, and it's very heavy. Now, that's not this one. Uh, it's a very heavy piece of equipment, and it snaps on the shoulders. Well, they didn't usually put that on until we got into flak. And it, being so heavy and me not being used to it, I was standing at the waist window looking out and an 88 exploded right in front of my face. Well, I dropped to the floor and grabbed that flak suit and tried to get it on. And they also have a helmet that they wear. The only thing I got on was the helmet. Now, in 
in that, that particular day, we were, we were carrying what they call shaft. And shaft is much like Christmas tinsel. It came in a little container, a cardboard container about so long, and there was a chute down at the bottom right under the, the waste gun that you would just hold that uh, little butt container of shaft and it would just suck it right out. And the idea of that was to let a little bit of shaft out every second or so. And that shaft would float down and it would affect the radar of the German gunners. Well, in the excitement and not being trained to, to get the shaft out of the, the plane properly, I fell on my knees and I got that box of shaft out of there in about 10 seconds. <laughs> and actually, it didn't do anybody any good because it was just a big blob coming down that the Germans were probably saying that must be some kind of a new weapon they have. You know? All right. All right. Oh, Jack, would you kindly start over? <laughs> <laughs> I want to just thank my son, Dennis. He's the guy that did that. Maybe we can just get through these first few. There's, a, I think, a couple of letters. These are the letters that I talked about. This one's from Raymond White, who was the superintendent of schools. Pardon? Um, the lights? I think there's one right over here that might work. Anyway, this is the letter. And I, I maybe the reason I saved these because they said nice things about me. And I don't think that too many people were saying nice things about me when I was in high school. I, I wasn't really a good student. And as a matter of fact, I was a pretty bad student. And I, I think maybe they just did this so that I, they could get rid of me. You want to show the next one, please? We can just kind of get through these next few. This is, this is from the, the priest, my parish priest. OK, you can show the next one. And, uh, all right, that's, that's the picture that I was telling you about the lower ball. And that's the way the ball turret fits. I think I have a, see if I, see if I can work this one. Oh, that one don't work, is it? What do you want? Oh, well, I'll point it out. Anyway, this is the turret that was in the scaffold. And this is the turret that you would get up. The door, the door is open. The door is back this way. And there's a man sitting. The man's head is right here. And, and he's just sitting in the turret. Uh, and that's OK, good. Thanks. You can see that guy right there. So every day we would get in this turret until we got used to it. And then they, they had. Actually, the guns were on there, and they had uh, cameras that would put project planes on the on the wall of the of this room, and we would follow that with the the uh, ball turret. And on top of the, the guns, we had two triggers that you just push the buttons and fire them, and that would take a picture of what we were looking at to see how we were doing in tracking the, these planes. You want to show the next one? This is the the test that I had to take to draw. A kind of a schematic of uh, the lower ball turret. And I'm not exactly sure what any of it means now, but uh, I, I, I pretty much knew what was going on in those days. OK, you can turn it. Next one. And this is a guy in the ball turret hanging with his head out. Now, you can see that that turret's not very big. And, and you'll see some pictures later on that will give you a better idea of how big it is. OK. This picture I got down at our at Kingman, Arizona, or at uh, Tucson, Arizona, where we have a, uh, a museum down there. And I thought this was the best picture that showed uh, exactly how the gunner sits inside the ball. And you can see that he's sitting here with his, his feet are up over here. Oops. And, and actually, that's the position that I said was so comfortable. You'd be just like you're sitting in your living room lounge chair. Uh, the, the gun handles were right up here. There were co two control handles that I could use. If I pushed them down, the turret went down. If I turned them this way, the turret would spin around. The turret would go 360 degrees around and 90 degrees up and down. So I had a, a pretty good spot to see everything that was going on below the plane. A lot of things were going on above the plane that I never knew about. Uh, and sometimes uh, you'd be sitting down there for a long time and didn't hear anybody. We were on. 
radio silence. We weren't supposed to use the radio unless it was for some kind of an emergency or we saw an enemy plane or something like that. So sometimes I'd be sitting down there for a half an hour and not hear a word. And I'd wonder if there's really anybody up there yet. You know, maybe they jumped out and I didn't know it. You can turn to the next one. And finally, I, got a, I graduated from gunnery school, and this is my diploma. Now, I said that I wasn't a very good student, and I'm pretty proud of this because actually this is the only diploma that I ever got in my life. Uh, when I was in the sixth grade, I was let down and I had to go to summer school, so I missed that graduation. When I was in eighth grade, I, I was left down, I missed that graduation. And then when I went into service in, in March of 1944, Graduation wasn't until June, and my father got my diploma for me. So, and then when I came out of the service and went to school, I finished two weeks ahead of the, the end of the school season, and I was out looking for a job, so I never went to that one either. So this is the only, only diploma that I ever got. You can show the next one. Uh, this is my crew. I'd like you to meet them. And this is Jack O'Brien, my pilot. He's from Buffalo, New York. Jack and I uh, see each other at least once a year, and we still talk on the phone two or three times a year. And Tommy Benzak was a co-pilot. Uh, Tommy lives out in, in uh, Palisades in, in California. And I, I don't think Tommy's doing real well right now. When his wife calls, or we call her, we talk to her, but she won't put him on the phone. So I don't, I'm not really sure what's, what's going on. But those two guys and myself are the only ones that are, are left. There were nine of us on the crew. And uh, this next guy, Jerry Ransom, we called him Tex because he was from Texas. Uh, and actually, Jerry is one of my heroes. He, he stayed in the service and became a fighter pilot. And he was the first pilot to fly 100 missions in Vietnam. And then he came home on a leave and went back to Vietnam and flew 230 more missions. Uh, he stayed in the service, made a career of the service. And when he came out, he was, he was a full colonel. And he had ribbons from here to here. And Ralph Hartman is from uh, Kendallville, Indiana. Ralph is no longer with us, but his children still come to our reunion. Every year we have a reunion somewhere in the United States. They try to change it around. One year might be on the West Coast, and the next year it might be here. This year it happened to be down at Tucson, Arizona, where our museum is. And he had uh, two of his sons were there and one of his grandchildren. And Texas wife still comes to the reunion. So uh, we're a pretty close group. We, we stayed together and, and uh, uh, did everything together while we were in the service. You want to give me the next picture, please? On top is... Uh, oh, I went too far. How do, I yeah. back How do we back it up? <laughs> well, I can, I can go from here. That's okay. You don't have to go back. Uh, Ralph was from, as I say, Kendallville, Indiana, and his kids still come to the reunion. Uh, and then uh, we had a guy by the name of uh, Tommy Camel, who was our radio operator. He was from Valdosta, Georgia, down in the Hokey Fanuki swamps. And uh, Don Davis was our tail gunner. Don was the oldest one on the crew. He was 30 years old. And this is a picture of our crew uh, when we came down from a mission. And this is actually the only picture we have of the, the whole crew uh, together. Everybody else, uh, during the time that they were in, either in uh, flight school or in, in, in training somewhere, they had uh, pictures of their crew taken and they were, they were put into the, the, uh, the book that was published by the 390th Bomb Group. But we were flying so much we didn't have time to get our picture taken. This is the tail gunner here, Don Davis. You didn't meet him before. That's Slats Lindsay, he was the engineer, and, and that's Judd Seaford, he was the, the waste gunner. Now Judd and I became very good friends. He, he was from Chicago, and when I got married, he came in and was in my wedding, and <clears throat> when he got married, I went out to Chicago, and I was in his wedding, and we have skied together for about 28 years. He eventually moved out to Colorado, and Cass and I would go out to Colorado every year and, and see him and ski with him. So. When he was, he had a pretty unique funeral. What, he wanted his ashes spread on a lake that he, he used to hunt and fish at up in northern Wisconsin. And uh, my wife and I went up to the funeral when they spread the, the ashes and we stayed in the fishing camp where he stayed. 
and the next morning we went out to this point on an island uh, where he used to fish and have his shotgun beside him in case a couple of ducks came over and they spread the ashes on the water and then they poured a double martini with three olives in it on top of that and that, that was his drink so that's the way he wanted to go. Everybody looks kind of tired in here except the pilot. He must have been sleeping. So we didn't get an awful lot of rest. When we get up to go on a mission, it might be anywhere from 2 to 3 o'clock in the morning, and we didn't get back until maybe 5 or 6 o'clock at night. So it was a long day. Some of our missions were 10, 12 hours long. Okay, you can show the next one. Just give me one. That's it. This is another picture of us uh, coming down uh, from a mission. You can see here that Ralph has his shoes tied on his parachute harness. And just about everybody did that in case you had to bail out because they wore big boots that were fur-lined and it would be awful difficult if you were trying to escape with something like that on your feet. Now the bull turret gunner didn't have these big boots. I had a pair of felt boots with uh, rubber, black rubber soles on them and they were comfortable enough that I could walk without carrying my, my uh, shoes, my army shoes with me on a, on a mission. Uh, you can see Don has it, still has his parachute uh, harness on, and this is, this is probably my parachute. I'm walking toward it, and this bag is the bag that we, we, when we got on the ground, we took our flight suits off and put it in a big bag like that, and then took it back to the storage area where we stored it until the next day when we were going to fly. You can show the next one. This is, you can't see the name of the plane, but it's Cocaine Bill, and uh, that's Tommy, that's the uh, tail gunner and the, and the radio operator. And the guy in the middle is, n is named Fitchley. And I'll have to tell you the story about how we met Fitchley. The next guy is Walt Allen. He was from up here in Liberty Corners, New Jersey. And that's me on the end. We inherited co Cocaine Bill. When we got there, that was the plane that get, they gave us to fly. And uh, we, we went down in Cocaine Bill. I, I forget what mission it was. But uh, we, had one, we had two engines feathered and one of them was on fire. But we, ha we landed at a field in Belgium that was a, an American fighter base, and the week before it was a German fighter base. So we got back there. When they took the cowing off, uh, the, 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 I guess it was the number one engine, uh, the flames just shot up in the air. We didn't realize that it was on fire. It was just smoking. This is, this is our, our next plane then, the plane that they gave us. And we named this one, and the name of that plane is Lady Be Good. And uh, going back to Cocaine Bill, we, we left Cocaine Bill over there in Belgium, and I never realized that it got back to our base the day before we flew our last mission. And then I found out that co that was the fourth time Cocaine Bill went down, and every time it came back. So it was pretty t pretty tough uh, dude. This is Tommy Camel, the radio operator, on, sitting on top of the radio room. You can turn to the next one. And then Judd and Don and... That's Ralph Hartman, the, the uh, bombardier, standing below his turret. He had a turret much like mine, but he sat on the inside of the plane and, and operated that turret with handles. But that gun, that would turn 60 degrees and uh, 90 degrees down. Uh, that's Judd in the waist inside the, the airplane. And th they call it the waist because that's where the plane was, and, and that's where that position was, in the waist of the airplane. And, and that's uh, Don Davis in the, in the tail section. And he also had a turret that was operated from inside. And this is Judd standing outside, as I said, just trying to look cool. Next one. That's another picture of the crew when we came down from a mission. And this is Tommy Camel. He was the co-pilot. Uh, and this, on, this was on our way up, uh, way overseas. We, we left. Uh, for, for England, uh, and we, we, went, we flew to Bangor, Maine, and then to Goose Bay, Labrador, and then to Iceland, and then to Valley Wales, and then from Valley Wales, we took a train and a truck to our base. <clears throat> this is a prayer that, uh, that one of the guys in the 390th wrote on his, the day before his last mission. Pretty much says what it's all about, too, I think. Okay. I'm not done yet. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Okay. Now that's me standing beside the ball turret, and you can see how big the ball is, and you really have to get, you are in a ball when you get in there. You know, it's, uh, uh, there's not much room to move around. This is a, a picture of our Nissan hut. Now two crews slept in that hut, that two, of, two crews of the enlisted men, and there were five enlisted men on each crew. Uh, and then one day, uh, we came back from a mission and there was another guy in there, and it was at Fitchley. Remember Fitchley? Uh, and I, I said to him, what are you doing here? And he said, that, well, they told me that I could bunk with you guys. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, I got hit in the back with flak, and while I was in the hospital, my crew was shot down. So now he was an orphan, and he moved in with us, and we kind of took him under our wing. And then he was a, a what they call a spare gunner. They, he would fly with anybody that needed a gunner. He was a, a tail gunner, and he was also an engineer. So he flew in either position. And this, this is a bigger picture of Cocaine Bill, and that's Tommy Camel, the radio operator, and Judd and Don Davis and myself, okay? When I'm talking to the kids and I show them this picture, I ask them if they can figure out what's wrong with it. <laughs> you notice everybody's in their Class A uniform, and we have a nice dance band back there, and no girls. But the girls come in by truck, so they, I guess we were waiting for them. They, the WAFs used to come in. They were the girls that used to fire the anti-aircraft guns for the English. Okay, and that was, that's called the Rocker Club, and it was a pretty nice club until about 10 o'clock at night. This is a castle, the Framlingham Castle, that was very near our base. And this was always a pleasant sight to see, because just as we would get over the Framlingham Castle, we would start to peel off to come in to land at our base. And Judd and I would usually be standing in the waist, and our pilot and co-pilot were kind of a couple of hotshot guys, and they would delay just long enough peeling off that they had to really rack it up to get around, and we would be standing, looking out the waist window, and the next thing we were looking straight down at the ground. This is loading a 5,000-pound bomb on the bottom of the, of the, uh, the bomb bay. We never dropped a 5,000-pound bomb, but when I finished flying, I had to have a job, so I got a job in the photo lab, and I made up pictures, a lot of pictures for uh, the guys on our crew. And a lot of those pictures have disappeared over the years, but I did manage to save some of them. You can go to the next one. Again, I'm standing by the ball turret, and this is Tommy and, and myself and Judd. And this is me sitting in the ball turret, leaning out the back. Gives you some idea of the size of it. That's a P-51 on the left, and we called them our little buddies. They used to protect us, and, and when we were flying, we were flying late in the war, and they had developed wing tanks that they could put on those 51s, and they could fly all the way to their target with us. In the beginning of the war, the planes couldn't go that far, and they would have to turn back before the bombers got to their target. So the bombers were then uh, in bad shape with the, with the German fighters. But uh, they flew with us all the time. We didn't see them. They would be usually 5,000 feet above us, but if we had trouble and and, and we were hit by enemy fighters. These guys were right on top of them. Th this is a P-47, and that's, uh, they used that as a fighter, and uh, that was a very tough airplane. It, it would take a real beating. When we landed at the field uh, that was a P-47 field, there were actually two P-47 groups flying off that field. And when one group would land, the other group would take off, and it was constant uh, landing and taking off. And we finally found a plane that we could fly out of there, but we couldn't get out on the runway. And so finally O'Brien said, just get in and we're going. So he pulled out on the runway and away we went. But uh, it was, they were only 20 miles from the line, so it didn't take them long to get over and drop their bombs or do their strafing. Okay. This is a picture that's a pretty famous picture, actually. It's, it's a picture of the 390th in formation, and these are fighters they're up here, and there's, they have a name for it, and it's called Top Cover. Uh, you'll see this in a lot of magazines or books that are published about World War II. Okay. This is a picture I call Bombs Away. I, I don't understand why they're not all dropping at the same time, but uh, we usually, uh, on our missions, the lead plane would carry, the first bomb out would be a smoke bomb. 
and all the bombardiers would be watching that lead plane. And as soon as that smoke bomb came out, they would throw their switch and drop the bombs. If I'm doing, saying anything wrong, just let me know, George. <laughs> George was a bombardier. And that, that plane, well, th this is flying over uh, Holland when the Germans broke the dikes. And I was talking to a, I ran a trip to Washington to see the World War II Memorial. It started out with my wife and I were going to ride down to Washington, and then the children wanted to go, and the grandchildren wanted to go, and then I let some people here know, and they wanted to go. So I rented a 47-seat bus, and before I was done, I had to get a 54-seat bus, and we went to Washington, and these guys were our, our waiters. They took, uh, carried the drinks up and down the aisle and the crackers and so forth, so everybody had a good time. But I met a guy up in Horsham who owned some property right across from the Navy base. And I had been on another trip, and he let the people park their cars there, and the bus would bus pick them up. And he let me do the same thing. And the day that he, I went up to meet him, he had just gotten back from Normandy. He, he came over uh, to Normandy to see the uh, anniversary of the of invasion. And while I was talking to him, he told me that he was from Holland and that uh, his parents were in Holland and they came over to the United States and he was born here in this country and he was an American citizen and right before the war started they went back to Holland and then they couldn't get out of Holland and he was there uh, with, when the Germans had occupied it for five years and I, sh I said I have a picture in my car I want to show you and I showed it to him and I told him that these this was when they they broke the dikes and I never knew why they broke the dikes and he told me that they the Germans did that so that the Americans couldn't land paratroopers there okay this is just a picture of, of the formation. Uh, it gives you some idea how close we have to fly. Uh, and I think different bomb groups had different formations. And, and I tell the kids that, that the people that plan these missions are like a football coach. If they know what the offense is going to be, what kind of fighters or what kind of flack we're going to get, they design the, the type of mission that is going to best suit the protection of the bombers. And when they, when they fly in a group like this, they try to get tight enough that a, a German plane can't dive down through them. And, and if you notice how close they are, it'd be pretty tough for a German fighter to get through there. And also, when a German fighter's coming in, there's 12 50 caliber machine guns on a, a B-17. And probably four or five machine guns can be shooting at that one plane, but there might be five or six other planes shooting at that one plane. So that enemy fighter coming in could have 20, 50 caliber machine guns firing at him. So we weren't sitting ducks. Our bomb group on one mission earlier in the war shot down 63 enemy fighters. And that, that was a record and they, we received a presidential citation for it. Okay. This is a picture of flak. It's kind of hard to see, but all those little black dots that you see are flak. And the, when the Germans are shooting at the formation, they're not shooting at a plane. They're shooting in front of the planes, and they try to put up a barrage that they know that the B-17s are going to have to fly, or the B-24s are going to have to fly through. And when that explodes, pieces anywhere from this big to this big just fly out of there, and if they hit the plane, they can, they can cripple you bad enough to, to knock you down or, or cut you in half. Uh, when we go on a bombing mission, we get to a point that they call the IP, the initial point. And once you turn on that initial point, there's no more uh, activity in the, the way the planes fly. They fly straight ahead to the target. And at that point, usually the pilot puts the plane on automatic pilot and the bombardier is actually flying the plane with the bomb sight. Uh, so the, the Germans know that. They know when we turn on that IP, that we're not going to have any evasive action and they just put that barrage up there and we have to fly through it. And many times I've turned that turret to 12 o'clock and look at it and just think, boy, there's no way. Okay, but we always get through it. This is another picture of flak. And here's one, a B-17 going down with the tail shot off. So you can see what the flak can do. Okay. That's a picture of our airfield at the 390th. And you can see the heart stands 
along, spread out around the field. And that, they do that so that if the Germans come over to strafe, they can't just make a straight run and, and knock out five or six uh, uh, bombers at one time. And this is the way I see the, the bombs come out of the bomb bay. My turret is right here, and it's probably maybe as far as that table from me, uh, when the bomb bay doors open, I'm watching for the bombs to come out. And I can usually, depending on the weather, follow the bombs all the way down. If we're, if we're, we're at uh, 20,000 feet or so, I can usually follow the bombs right down to the ground. If we're up at 25,000 feet, you might lose them for a few seconds before they go off. But you see where they land, and one of the things that they, they use the ball turret gunner for is when we get back to debriefing, they ask us where we saw the bombs hit, and they have a, a map there. And actually, I guess the, the lower ball turret gunner is the only guy that can see uh, where the bombs hit, because the bombs are actually going along with the plane, uh, but eventually the plane's catching up to it, and, and we're almost directly over the target when, when, the, you know, when the bombs hit. OK. All right. This, these are, this is a German submarine pen, and that's been bombed out. Uh, and they had these out along the coast. Uh, I guess up at, most of them were up in Holland. Uh, and this is a marshalling yard. You can see where all the bombs hit. Now, George and I have had some discussions about how accurate we were with our bombing. And it turned out that w even though we had the great bomb site, the Norton bomb site, uh, it wasn't as, as effective in in warfare as it was when they were testing it. And there's a lot of conditions, the conditions that uh, you're getting, the plane is getting bounced around sometime by flak or, or uh, bad weather. Uh, but there's, if we didn't get the target today, we went back the next day and got it. So uh, eventually we wiped out just about everything that we went after. OK. And these were just a couple of pictures, the Eiffel Tower and the Tri RC Triumph. Uh, they were in that box that I talked about, so I threw them in the book. OK. Uh, this was a, an article that was in the newspaper. Uh, and my mother, I guess, saved that for me. And that was in the box also. So I put that up there. It, it just tells about the, the bombing that we were doing. And, and this, this tells us about the Regensburg uh, raid where we shot down the 63 enemy fighters. OK. This is a list of my missions, uh, and the dates are all on there, so you can count up the 87 days. OK. This is a picture of a P-51. Uh, th th again, this we called our little buddy. OK. And that's a P P-47, and then a, and that, this is a Messerschmitt, German Messerschmitt. OK. And this is a Folk Wolf. Now, the Folk Wolf had a radial engine, a round engine, and it looked similar to the P-47. Uh, it, it looked uh, similar to it if you were excited. And if you thought that a P-47 came in on a con pursuit curve, uh, you, you could really think that it may be a, a Folk Wolf. And when we went down in Belgium, they sent a, a P-47 out to meet us to take us in. And this guy was just clowning around and turned and came in on a pursuit curve, and I was that close. I had him in the sights. We had, we had that's another thing about the Vol turret. We had an electric gun sight down there that to me today, uh, I didn't think anything ab about it in those days, but today to think the technology that they had back that far was really amazing. I had a pedal under my left heel, and when I pushed that pedal in, two lines would go together like this, and when I got those two lines, on the wingtips of that Messerschmitt or the Folk Wolf, it determined how fast he was going, uh, what speed, how much the lead had to be. The guns may be pointing here and the target may be pointing there. But it, it amazed me that they had that kind of technology. Now, they came out later in the war, as I said, when I was flying. I fl when I flew, our 35th mission was the last mission of the war. And I always thought that our crew should get some credit for ending the war, but nobody ever wants to hear me. But uh, that w our, our bomb group uh, flew 301 missions, and we flew 35 of them. Our crew th flew 35 of them. OK. This is an ME-262. This is the German jet. And we were flying as, as uh, 
George said a little while ago at about 150 miles an hour, and this, this guy was flying at 550 miles an hour. So we didn't have much chance with him. Uh, the tail gunner called off this, one of these jets coming in, and I couldn't see him because he was up a little too high, but as he went underneath us, I turned my turret to fire at him, and by the time I got around to 12 o'clock, he was a dot. So I let him have a couple anyway. <laughs> the bullets were going like this by the time they got to him. Okay. This is another picture of the ME-262. And then finally, the war is over, thank God. And Germany quit. And this, uh, they were talking about uh, earlier about the Chowhound missions. And this is actually a picture taken from the Bombay where they dropped food over Holland right after the war. <coughs> and somebody, uh, I guess, Don, you sent the, the email to me? Yes, there's an excellent, uh slideshow that you can see on the web and um, you send me an email I'll send you the information about it okay now this is our museum down in Tucson Arizona and that's a picture uh, that's a b-17 that was refurbished and it's in beautiful condition uh, I don't know this this was it must have been about five or six years ago this picture was taken uh, this is our colonel here, Colonel Moore, and we have uh, a reunion, as I said, every year, and we have two banquets at that reunion. And one of the banquets is called a hangar party, and it's usually held in, in a, uh, an army base somewhere, uh, and he pays for, the, for, the reu for that banquet. And he's paid for it ever since we started having reunions, when we used to have about 800 people come. Now we're down to about 250, and the colonel has been dead for about four years, but he's still paying because he has it in his will. As long as somebody comes, he'll pay. Okay. This is a copy of the telegram that I sent to my mom when I got back in the States. I'm sure she was glad to see that. Okay. And my discharge. Okay. Okay. And I show this to the kids because it's the letter from the VA telling me that I'm eligible to, to go to school and they're going to pay me $50 a month to do it. And then somehow they told me they're going to give me $50 here, but they must have changed their mind because at the bottom they gave me 65 So I didn't, I didn't complain about it. You got a raise. Yeah, yeah right. Okay. <laughs> and that's it, folks. Anybody has any questions? No. Don't forget, I will bring the microphone to the person who's going to raise the question so that everybody in the room can hear it and so Jack can direct the answers. Excuse me? It's on. It's working. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me, right? can you hear me now? <laughs> What is a sortie? Uh, that's a, a mission that, uh, that's one plane, a sortie, yeah, right. Generally apply the fighters. Jack, uh, in the event of an emergency, how do you get out of that ball turret? Well, if, if I lost the power in the ball turret, the, the people, my waist gunner, my buddy Judd, could crank me out. And as long as the, the ring gear wasn't damaged, he could crank me around and then crank the guns down so that I could come out of the turret. Well, when you're firing a gun, don't you get a lot of active smoke in that? Well, not really. The, the, the air is blowing right through the ball turret. You know, we didn't have, uh, uh, we didn't have our planes, yeah, we're not uh, sealed. Who's air conditioned? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my old neighbor, George. Don't pick on me. Here. I've seen uh, I've seen a lot of uh, films on men being trained to be gunners. 
I've seen a lot of men being trained to be gunners, and they did a lot of skeet shooting. Is that right? Right. Out there? Yeah. Actually, uh, we not only uh, shot skeet from the ground, we they put, had a truck rigged with a 50 caliber, with, actually it was a 12-gauge uh, shotgun that had 50 caliber handles on it. And when we would drive the truck around the, this track, uh, they would shoot the skeet out, and we would we'd probably be going 20 miles an hour, and we would be shooting the skeet with this 12-gauge shotgun. And uh, all that was was to teach you to lead. Uh, if uh, before I went in the service, I did some hunting, and it's, so I was pretty good with a shotgun. But if you're going to shoot at a pheasant that gets up, and the pheasant's flying directly across, you can't shoot right at the pheasant because he's out of your out of your shot before it gets there. So you actually have to lead the, the bird. So, and that's the same thing with an, an airplane. When an airplane is coming in, you have to lead them. And all, all the attacks that were made by, by enemy fighters, unless they come in directly behind you or straight at you, they, had, they come in from the side, they would turn up like this, and they would slide in, and then they would turn this way and just keep sliding. And actually, they were shooting up here, and you, you would be flying in their, their bullets. Okay. Anyone on this side? Here you go, sir. This was not the gunner, but how accurate was that Norton bomb site? And were you using it, for example, during the Battle of the Ardennes? Because the whole reason for the American Air Force, you could bomb more accurately by day and British bomb by night wherever they could drop them. Right. Well, I, I don't know that much about the bombs. Uh, George could give you an answer on that, I'm sure. Well, I'm, I'm going to make it bomb site detonation. The, uh, oh, the Norden bomb site had the ability to, uh, to be very accurate. However, it took the pilot and the bombardier to establish a level flying platform up there. If you were just a half a bubble off in either direction, you were going to have a significant error because if you were flying as we, as we did on uh, at the Battle of the Bulge, we were flying about 20 about 24,000 feet. Well, a slight error at 24,000 feet is a tremendous error on the ground, probably 800 feet, 800 and 900 feet. So it had the capability, however, uh, circumstances prevented it from uh, really being recognized. In fact, they found that the average, <coughs> the average accuracy was about 20%. In other words, 20% of the bombs fell within 1,000 feet of the target. That's not very good. George, we have a Bye. excuse me. George, we have a technician, a bomb site technician here that oh, might be able to. Good. <coughs> excuse me. I was a hello. I was a bomb site technician, and uh, in the Korean War, and uh, we would bring the bomb sites in for pre preventive maintenance. And when we did, we'd make sure that they were as accurate as they could be. We used mercury mirrors to make sure that the, and the um, scope was collimated. And when it left our shop, if there was a good bombardier as a lead bombardier, then that group did a real good job. Thank you. <laughs> Jack, do you, yes. could you just be a certain height for being a... Well, they, they say that. They say that uh, they look at eyes, and that's probably why they picked me. However, I know we have a guy that has lunch with us who's, how tall is Wally? About 5'10", 5 5'11"? 5 5 and he was a, he was a bombardier, or he was a lower ball gunner. There was, there was one of the slides that said six feet. Yeah. That you had. Did it? Oh, yeah. How long did it take you to straighten up if you got out of that ball turret? You can always tell a ball turret gunner when he walks down the street because he's always walking this way. How about over here? Yes, sir? Did you ever have body cramp? No, no. I uh, I wrestled at Abington High School, and I I was in pretty good physical condition when I went in this. Oh yeah, Glenn Snodgrass. Yeah. 
So I was in pretty good condition. And, and actually, uh, it looks like it would be very uncomfortable, but it's not. You know, the, you get so used to it that it's part of you. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. You can, you can haul around. Right. Okay. Did you have a parachute in there with you, or did you have to climb out, get into your chute, and then drop out of the plane if you were shot down? Yeah, I, I had this, a story that I was going to tell about that, too, and, and maybe I'll, I'll tell it now. Uh, there wasn't enough room to take the parachute down in the ball turret. I'm going to tell you a story in just a minute about a guy that did take it down. And what he did was just fasten the chute on one side, and the chute was laying on his, on his leg. Uh, but I used to leave my chute right outside of the ball, and the waist gunner and I, Judd and I, used to practice. I would come out, and he would snap the chute on me. And, and I'm pretty sure he'd have been there. But anyway, let me tell you this story. Remember I told you how Fitchley, I met Fitchley in the barracks, and he was shot? Well, when he was shot down, his crew, when he was hit, he was in the hospital, and uh, his crew went on a mission, and they were shot down. And he didn't know really what happened to them. And after the war, at one of our reunions, the, the lower ball gunner came to the reunion, and he, hold, he told us this story. He, that day, had a bad premonition about the mission for some reason. And he took the parachute and hooked it on one side. The parachute harness, as you maybe saw in here, is, 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 goes down here and, and goes under your legs and up over your back. And then when you're ready to put the parachute harness on, there's two hooks like this that you just snap it on and, and the chute can't come off. But anyway, he had it hooked on one side. And when they got hit, he came up out of the, they got a direct hit. When he came up out of the ball turret, the plane broke in half just as he got out of the ball. And he just kind of floated up, and he felt, felt somebody give him a shove, and he went out the top of the plane. Now, he's five miles above the ground, hanging, falling, with the parachute hooked on one side. And of course, the parachute now was up here, because the wind was blowing it, and, and he was trying to pull it back down and hook it on. And when he just about get it down, the wind would blow it out of his hand again. And this happened three or four times. And finally, he said, you know, the trees were getting so close, he said, to hell with it, and he pulled the, the ripcord. And when he did, it, it swung him way out because he was just hooked on one side. When he came back down, he broke his ankle. And that was just the beginning of his trouble because there was a gang of kids that had guns, and they put a rope around his neck, and they were taking him into town to hang him. And just then, a guy from the Luftwaffe come along on a bicycle who could speak English as good as Bill Pace. Bill Pace was the guy, the lower ball gunner that bailed out. And he took Bill away from the kids and took him into the local jail and put him in jail. And then they transported him to one of the Stalag camps. And he spent the rest of the war in, in, the, in the prison camp. And the story that I told about Fitch, I have some stories that I, I tell about the, a what if story. And when Fitch was hit, I showed you the parachute harness, how thick it was. It hit him in the parachute harness and drove the harness into his back. But the parachute harness saved his life because if he had moved this far, that, par that piece of flak would have gone right through him and probably killed him. And then what if it didn't hit him at all? He would have been on that mission with Bill Pace and he would have been in the tail or in the engineer's place and they never got out. Only three guys got out of the plane that day, the pilot, the co-pilot, and Bill Pace, the lower ball gunner. And the lower ball gunner never gets out. Okay, I, I, <laughs> I told my other story. All right, a couple of questions. One over here. <clears throat> right behind you. Oh. I have a, another one it's in your category. The reason for the Flying Fortress and all the ball gunners was supposedly it didn't need as much fighter escort as compared with the B-40, B-24, which didn't have much, as many uh, ball tears, did the Flying Fortress do its job, or did you really need the, the P-51s and P-40s to escort you? Did uh oh, we needed them. The uh, the fighters had a, had an advantage, uh, but uh, no, we were very happy to have the 
the people flying us, with us to protect us. And the and the P uh, or the the B twenty four had a lower ball, but it actually went back up into the plane. Well, thank you for your uh, your questions and. Uh,